For this portion of the respiratory discussion um, for children, I'm going to focus on chronic illnesses or chronic diseases that children incur um, for the respiratory system. So primarily in this portion, I'm going to focus on asthma and also uh, cystic fibrosis. So to uh, focus you on the textbook, we are in the text on page 1223 and it goes all the way to 1235 in the text for asthma. Um, and in the, there is a chapter in ATI that you can also reference, and it's chapter 18 that starts on page 175. So if you're following along with me in your uh, PowerPoint, um, it is actually PowerPoint number 71 where we're starting. But asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of, the, um, of our airways, uh, particularly our lower airways. Some people also call um, asthma a reactive airway disease. And what you're going to see is that there is um, constriction, vasoconstriction that occurs. There is also mucosa swelling that occurs and also accumulation of secretions that can occur. Um, it can come and go, so that's why it's called episodic. And it is considered a hyper-responsive reaction in the bronchioles. Um, so um, that's some of the, the patho that goes on. Um, you have a slide in your PowerPoint that actually shows you some of those normal airway versus an abnormal, and that's where you can see the vasoconstriction, the, um, the mucosal swelling, and also secretion. So keeping that in mind, I want you to already start thinking about what are some of the treatments that we do for asthma, because we certainly use medications that will help um, uh, vasodilate the smooth muscle, which are some of our um, uh, bronchodilators. We also use corticosteroids to reduce inflammation of the, um, the mucosa, and we also use uh, mucolytics to help get out that the extra mucus in the lungs, as well as chest physiotherapy. Chest physiotherapy can use, be used for children with asthma, as well as children you will find out later with um, with um, uh, cystic fibrosis. If you're following along with me in the book, there I just want to point out a couple of things that are helpful. There is something on page 1232, um, which is a care plan for somebody that has, for a child that has an asthma attack. And I want you to note that um, the diagnosis that's listed first is risk for suffocation. Um, and of course, that's related to the fact that the triggers, the allergens or respiratory tract infection or could be exercise, it could be cold, it could be something in allergens, um, it depends, like some, are, some pollens and that type of thing. Even emotions and temperature changes can cause vasoconstriction. So that is one of the, the main uh, diagnoses you'll see with a child that's ha having uh, asthma. Um, and, and some of the things that we can do to help that child are also listed there. There's also some, there's also on, on page 1230, uh, a care plan specifically for a child that's having an acute asthma attack versus someone that has asthma all the time. So if someone's having an acute asthma, they call it exacerbation, what would be a good diagnosis for that child? Well, your book talks about ineffective airway clearance, and that's related to inflammation and that constriction I was talking about with the bronchial tree. And of course, airway clearance is one of those priorities where you talk about ABCs, and so the, the goal for this child is that they have appropriate ventilation capacity, O2, CO2 exchange, and that they're, going to, they're able to breathe more easily. So all of the things that we talk about with um, how to promote oxygenation um, when we talked in, in class about how to promote um, maximum oxy oxygenation and respirations in, 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 this, uh, in these nursing interventions for a child that's having an acute asthma attack. Things like what is the position of comfort for a child? And in your um, PowerPoint, I have a, a child that's sitting in a tripod position with her arms on her, on her legs. Of course, over the bedside would be a tripod position too. We want to give oxygen for this child and also we want to um, have as much um, uh, calmness as that we can so that we can exude calmness so that the parents will be calm, which will help the child 
be able to slow their breathing down during an acute asthma attack. Um, we do, during an acute asthma attack, also administer rescue medications. And so there are listed of what some of those medications are. Um, B agonists are meter dose inhalers. We can also give um, uh, nebulizer treatments or aerosol, aerosol nebulization in the first 60 minutes. Um, we could also give um, high dose B agonist uh, and anticholinergic drugs as, as age appropriate mixed with oxygen. So really focus in on page 1230 is what some of the, of the possible, uh, s s possible interventions would be for a child with an acute attack. In a, an adjunct to the rescue drugs that we, the child breathes in, we also give on occasion oral corticosteroids and an, a brand name for that would be Oropred, but that also helps to decrease the inflammation. Um, as we're doing these medications, of course, we're monitoring the child's reaction, we're listening to breath sounds, we're seeing if their, their breathing slows down and becomes less, um, less labored and also making sure that their anxiety goes down. Uh, small, clear, small oral fluids would be helpful. Um, and then if you do have a child that has gone into something um, that is status asthmaticus, which is an asthma attack that's not coming out or the child's not recovering from, then you would want to give something IV, uh, maybe some IV epinephrine or some, uh, something else to help that child, and that would be the emergency situation. Um, so some of the questions I posed for you on this particular slide, and I'm on slide 73, but what in your whole respiratory slides, what are nursing interventions that are appropriate? And also what is the purpose of a peak expiratory flow meter? So the, the flow meter um, is something that children use in order to see how well they are doing with, um, with their uh, maintenance of asthma and with asthma in general. Um, on page uh, 1226 of your book, it talks about um, using a flow meter um, for, for several different reasons. You can certainly um, have it as part of the diagnosis, even though for diagnosing uh, asthma, they use um, looking at the symptoms which would be in box 40-15 on page 1225. It talks about the clinical manifestations of asthma, which include the cough, uh, hacking or paroxysmal, um, also respiratory related symptoms and signs. Things like shortness of breath, uh, wheezing that's audible, um, apprehension or sweating. Um, the chest is, you can see coarse or hear coarse loud breath sounds and crackles. And then um, as, as a, if a child has repeated episodes or long-term asthma, it could be that the child would have some of the symptoms of chronic hypoxemia, which would include the barrel chest, um, using you know, elevated shoulders, using accessory muscles, um, and that type of thing. So look at box 4015 to 40-15 to look at the clinical manifestations. So basically the diagnosis of asthma is based on um, those clinical manifestations and then you'd, you'd, you'd look at the history, you would do a good physical exam, and in a, in a lesser sense, the laboratory results that could happen. Um, so generally, a chronic cough in the absence of infection or diffuse wheezing, especially during the expiratory phase, is sufficient to st establish a diagnosis. <clears throat> I will say that again, um, chronic cough in the absence of infection or uh, a diffuse wheezing during the expiration phase of respiration is sufficient to establish a diagnosis for asthma. Sometimes they'll also do pulmonary function tests to see if there's actually a presence or absence of lung disease. Um, and then spirometry can be performed at probably around five or six years old reliably, re reliably on children. Um, and then they test it every one or two years to see how well the child is doing. So the other measurement that I asked the question about was um, the question about peak um, expiratory flow rate. The peak expiratory flow rate measures the, the maximum amount, amount of air that um, can be forcibly exhaled in one second. Um, and so 
it is measured in liters per minute and they, um, they have a peak flow meter. If you think about a diabetic, a child that has diabetes or an adult that has diabetes, they use uh, blood glucose screening machines or monitors to test how high their blood glucose is. In a similar fashion, we might want to look at a peak expiratory flow meter as similar to that because it can really help to see um, how well a child is doing in relationship to um, their personal best. And, and so um, when, we, when we look at um, this, a child, what we'll do is we'll tell the child to take a deep breath and blow as forcibly as they can into a peak flow meter. I don't have one to show you right here, but there's pictures of it in, in different uh, areas of your book and, and also should be in your sim lab. So you blow into the peak flow meter and the peak flow meter on page 1226 are some guidelines on how you interpret the peak flow meter. The child's breath moves a dial and what they do is they do it into color coded zones. And um, we are going to post onto D2L a teaching sheet that you can use with families to see what these zones are so that you can teach parents how to know what's going on. But what you would do is the three zones are actually used to interpret the peak um, expiratory flow rate. Sometimes that's called PEFR. The zone system is basically patterned after a traffic light so that parents can easily see what is going on. So if a child blows and the monitor is in the green zone on the little uh, peak flow, that is basically meaning that it's 80 to 100 percent of the child's personal best. In other words, everything is clear, just like a green light means go. It means that the asthma is under reasonable control and nothing else needs to be done at this point. No symptoms are present and the routine treatment plan for control is what is, is continued. If the peak flow meter after the child has breathed into it is in the yellow zone, that's just like the yellow of a light, of a, of a, um, of a traffic light. That means caution. It's 50 to 79% of the child's personal best. And what it means is that the asthma is not well controlled. So something else needs to be done. An acute exacerbation may be present. Maintenance therapy may need to be increased. So that if a parent, if you tell a parent, you know, they're in the yellow zone, you need to contact the healthcare provider, see what else, um, uh, making sure that the child at least stays in this zone and does not go into the final signal light zone, which is the red light. Red light is only, um, it's 50, uh, below 50% 50 of the child's personal best, which is not very good at all. It is a medical alert. It is a medical, it's a severe airway narrowing that's occurring. And so just like a, a stoplight, you, you need to tell the parent, you need to stop and, and get some help for this child. Um, a short acting, maybe bronchodilator would be ap appropriate. And of course, notify the healthcare provider um, because if the child, after using the rescue inhaler or that short term bronchodilator, if the child does not come out of that, and of course goes into like status asthmaticus, which is, is life threatening, um, then you'd have to have the parent call 911 but they actually need to return back into the yellow or green zone in order for, you know, for the family member to feel good about what has occurred. So that's kind of an explanation of the peak flow, uh, the peak expiratory flow meter and how to, um, and how to read it. Um, there's, like I said, those guidelines are in 1226. Of course, ATI has this summarized as well. Um, so you can, um, see that there are different categories um, of asthma and on page um, 1224 before I talked about the peak flow meter back on page 1224 it talks about exactly what the different uh, categories are it talks about intermittent asthma and that would be the symptoms are less than two days per week um, and it talks about the um, it, there's no interference with normal activity. So that's the intermittent category. That would be the, the one that would be least concerning. Then they talk about the second 
uh, highest level is it would be considered category two basically mild persistent asthma and this is asthma that the symptoms are greater than two times a week but less than one time per day um, sometimes they have nighttime symptoms um, there is interference with normal activity but minor for this particular one they might need a short acting um, beta agonist for symptom control um, greater than two days a week but not every single day so that's mild persistent and then the next category would be category that would be called moderate persistent asthma um, a child with moderate persistent Persistent is the key word here. There are daily symptoms that this child has for asthma. And also the child has three to four times a month um, nighttime symptoms. So the, um, this does interfere with normal activity since it's daily. There is some limitation of the child's daily activities. This child also needs uh, beta agonists for symptom control, but it is every day. So this child is on daily medication and this is starting to make this a chronic illness. And the worst or the highest category is called severe persistent um, asthma. They are continual symptoms throughout the day, seven days a week, there's nighttime symptoms. And of course the child has extremely limited. I would expect this child to also be at the red zone um, frequently and so they need um, daily medicine but not just once a day several times a day is when they're going to be needing this medication um, as I talked about the clinical manifestations of asthma and I referred you to page 1225 for that I've kind of jumped ahead of myself about diagnostic evaluation we've already talked about the clinical manifestations we've talked about the history some of the history of coughing and other kinds of, of symptoms that you might see um, and then the physical exam, what you might see as far as the child and the wheezing that you might see. Um, and then there's some tests that are listed there also. Um, sometimes a, a, a chest x-ray will be ordered to see if there are any infiltrates in the lungs and any kind of changes in the lungs. So there is a question here on your slide. The nurse knows teaching about asthma with an eight-year-old child has been, has been effective when the child makes which statement? My peak flow meter can tell me if an asthma episode might be coming, if, even if I'm feeling well. When I do my peak flow, it works best if I do three breaths without pausing in between breaths. I always start with the meter reading about halfway up to save breaths. If I use my peak flow meter every day, I will not have an asthma attack. So think about that question. So we've already talked about peak flow. The child should use it to establish their baseline and their personal best and then see how it can be used. So the answer is A, the peak flow meter really does alert a child to see if asthma episode might be coming. Even if they're feeling well, it might be able to say, hey, something's going on that you might need to change your plan. Um, so the next thing that you're, um, that what I didn't go over a little bit with you um, on the slides but are part of your book also. It talks about some of the um, triggers for asthma exacerbations. So you'll find that on page 1224, box 4014. And as I said, the triggers can be outdoor triggers, allergy kind of triggers, some irritants like tobacco or wood smoke, um, uh, chemicals that you might spray in your home, the parent may spray in their home. We have something called exercise-induced asthma where a child would take like maybe a bronchodilator or something to help them go through PE class because they, it's exercise that triggers their asthma attack. Um, heat or cold, animal dander, um, even if they're angry or laughing or crying, they might go into it, as well as maybe um, having gastroesophageal reflux or other GI problems. Um, sometimes kids that are allergic to nuts or milk products also have this problem. And then sometimes um, females when they're having menses or pregnant or thyroid disease um, can also trigger um, asthma. So uh, one of the things we can do for teaching families would be on page 1227. There is a, uh, a box on allergy proofing the home and the community. And it talks specifically about things that parents can do as far as keeping the home humidified, um, not too dry, encasing pillows in 
uh, zippered cases, um, just in case they're allergic to dander or, or I mean, um, feathers or something like that. Um, and there's some really other good things about dust and animals and preventing smoke. It's keeping kids away from smoke, not just in the same room, but smoke on clothes, smoke on furniture, any kind of uh, secondhand smoke can trigger asthma attacks. Um, and so, okay, so we're now we're talking about the drug therapy for asthma. And um, you, you have um, a lot of different uh, things that are used pharmacologically. Um, it's basically pharmacological therapy are used to prevent and control asthma symptoms. And it, um, of course, they also reduce the frequency and severity of asthma exacerbations. That's why we have kids on controlled medicines. And then of course, emergency airflow obstruction to reverse that. So it's really based on what we use is based on what type of asthma they have, whether it be mild, intermittent, or, um, or severe. Um, and of course, it's always towards uh, long-term suppression of inflammation and helping the kids be, you know, if, you, if you've got asthma, just it's so hard to do sometimes your activities of daily living and just having full, you know, uh, fun time as a child. And so it does get in the way. So oftentimes we use quick relief and long-term medications in combination. And that's what slide 80 is talking about. Some of the long-term controlled meds would be things like inhaled corticosteroids, um, um, sometimes it would be things like uh, chromalone sodium and netochromil, and then we talked a little bit about long-acting beta-2 agonists. Some of these uh, leukotriene modifiers, these are, are drugs that you should have learned in pharmacology, and I would recommend that you go back and look up some of these drug classifications. Um, and then again, quick relief medications would treat symptoms and exacerbations when there is an emergency situation. A lot of the asthma medications are given by nebulizer treatment or inhalation with a nebulizer or maybe a metered dose inhaler, which we call an MDI. Remember that if you use a metered dose inhaler, there's a picture in your book on page 1227, and what is attached to the metered dose inhaler is a spacer. Now the benefit of a spacer, I'm sure that you can imagine, is that when they, when the child learns, this looks like a parent or somebody else helping the child, but when the child compresses the meter dose inhaler, if they do that directly in their mouth, a lot of times the spray goes on their tongue and their throat and it doesn't get down into their lungs because it takes a lot of coordination to take a deep breath and get it deep in the lungs. What happens if you have a spacer is that the meter dose um, inhaler is compressed the mist goes into the spacer. And then when the child takes a deep breath, they're able to get those particles way down into their lungs, which means it gets to where it belongs. Um, so we try to help kids learn how to use spacers uh, with either a mask or a mouthpiece. Um, those are really, really helpful. And so in order for them to um, be the best, there are some other kinds of inhalers that use dry powders. Um, if you use a dry powder inhaler, it talks about that the child needs to inhale those as quickly and deeply as possible to use them effectively. Um, so anyone that has difficulty, if a child has difficulty um, using an inhaler, then, um, then they have to try another type, maybe nebulizer or some other medication with compressed air or oxygen. So children um, should be, if they're using a, a nebulizer, told to breathe normally in and out uh, with their mouth open um, so it gives the, the child the ability to take breaths as they need to. Um, we've talked about some other kinds of uh, medications that can be used like corticosteroids. Um, those are anti-inflammatory drugs and they're used to treat reversible airflow um, obstruction. It actually decreases the swelling and also helps with a hyper-responsiveness and chronic asthma. Inhaled corticosteroids are used as the first-line therapy in children older than five years old, so that's important to note. And there have been research studies that have shown that using um, corticosteroids in, in significantly improves um, asthma, including decrease of symptoms, emergency visits, and the overall medication requirements for these children. 
Um, corticosteroids can be administered all kinds of ways, parentally, orally, or by inhalation. And um, of course, remembering oral medications are metabolized slowly, so it may take up to three hours after administration of oral for them to work. That's why if you need to gain prompt control, you would want to do it um, in, in, a, in a different manner. Um, so page 1228 also shows you some other kinds of details about some of the medications used. Um, beta adrenergic agonists are things like um, albuterol and Zopinex. Those are both medications that can be used as both inhalers and I've used them in my clinic before with children in a nebulizer uh, treatment. Uh, they're used for acute exacerbations and also for the prevention of exercise-induced bronchodilation or bronchal, I'm sorry, bronchospasm. Um, so so uh, there are some other long-acting beta agonists that we can add to the kids' regimen. Um, Cerevent, which is salmeterol, it can be used twice daily, but no more than every 12 hours. Um, and so I would like you to th uh, fill out your medication template that ATI has and, and include in there the beta adrenergic agonists, the, the long-acting beta agonists, the corticosteroids. Um, chromalin sodium is used as a, a uh, maintenance therapy for asthma. It stabilizes uh, membranes. Um, it, it helps overall. Um, and so it's also explained on page 1228. Leukotrienes are another one that are used. Um, things like um, Singular, children that have allergies can use Singular on a long-term basis. They're not for acute episodes, but they are used to prevent symptoms with mild persistent asthma. Um, so that's an interesting thing too. Sometimes we use uh, anticholinergics like atropine uh, for relief of acute bronchospasm. So just kind of getting to know which ones are long-term, which ones are shorter, act, uh, shorter acting for emergency would be a good review on page 1228 specifically. All right, um, let's see where we are. This is just, uh, there's some pictures of children using spacers on there. And this, uh, th that it goes, continues on drug therapy for asthma using long terms like Cerevent, the leukotrienes, and others. There is some MDI motor, uh, meter dosed inhaler teaching on page 1234. So if you go to page 1234, there, um, well, page 1233, I would like to add, talks about how to use a peak expiratory flow meter. It actually tells you step by step how to take a child through this and that's really important treatment because if they don't use it well or know how to use it then it's not going to give you the right results for your you know your green yellow or red zone measurements but on page uh, 1234 is a wonderful table on how to use a, a mdi or a meter dosed inhaler so i want to make sure that you understand those steps so that you could teach a child if need be and this is just showing you a couple more pictures of children using nebulizers or their spacers getting breathing treatments. So our asthma interventions include how to teach parents about medications using that peak flow uh, meter and also the kids if they're old enough. Some, also teaching them about exercise and how exercise can trigger, trigger um, asthma attacks. And then um, how to use chest physiotherapy and we're going to go into more chest physiotherapy with cystic fibrosis and then teaching parents and children about the triggers what are their personal triggers and how we're, how we can reduce the environment some by getting rid of some of those triggers if you see a, a child that remains sitting up and refuses to lie down they have sudden agitation or they become really quiet and sweaty, this could be a sign of severe respiratory distress in children with asthma and immediate attention needs to be done. So the tripod position is one of those th positions you might see a child in. I do have a slide on status asthmaticus and it talks about what are some of the um, emergency things that you need to do for a child that has status asthmaticus, which is um, a medical emergency. It's a medical emergency. There's one other thing I want to point out to you all about asthma and triggers. Um, you really, I said that avoiding asthma um, allergens is important, and one of the things that can trigger asthma attacks is the use of aspirin. 
Of course, um, it's not recommended to use aspirin in general in children, a lot of times with upper respiratory infections. We talked a little bit about cardiac reasons to use aspirin, but it is safe for children to use acetaminophen as the uh, analgesic of choice, especially for a child that might have asthma. Okay, so review. Um, this is all we're gonna talk about right now for, um, for asthma, and let's move now into cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis is, starts on page uh, 1235, and it is an inherited disease. It's called an autosomal recessive trait. Um, so the affected child has inherited the disease or inherited the defective gene from actually both parents. Um, <clears throat> one in four of if both parents carry the gene. Um, the, um, it talks a little bit more about the genetic parameters. That would be just something for you to, to, to think about. It's 95% of the cases are known in Caucasians versus other kinds of groups. So um, it is considered a lethal genetic illness, um, and it kind of tells you a little bit about incidence here. In page 1235, there is a, um, a nice slide that looks like a slide that would be right out of your patho book because it talks about that this is an exocrine, exocrine, E-exocrine gland dysfunction, which means it affects, as you can see in this little chart, bronchi. So the bronchial, um, the bronchi things that it does is it creates thick, tenacious, I use that term, tenacious means sticky, um, sticky secretions in the bronchial, uh, in the bronchi, which causes bronchial obstruction and it causes, um, can cause pneumonia and it eventually can cause emphysema in these kids. Um, so that's the exocrine gland reaction or result in the respiratory system. It also causes um, abnormal mucus secretion in the GI tract. So small intestine, pancreatic ducts, and the bile ducts are all affected. Um, what can happen is that it can have uh, intestinal obstruction of the newborn. And one of the ways we diagnose cystic fibrosis, one of the things that happens in newborn children is they do not pass that first meconium stool. And that is a sign, um, lack of passage of that meconium stool is a sign that maybe this child has cystic fibrosis. So if this child does not pass the meconium stool, which you've learned about, in OB is that sticky black stool that kids have when they're first born. That could be a sign that they have cystic fibrosis and they will follow that up with a sweat chloride test. And what they'll find with children that have cystic fibrosis is an abnormally high sweat chloride. Um, you're also going to see that there's pancreatic duct problems. It's degeneration of the pancreas. So they end up with malabsorption and problems with um, digestion and they also um, end up with fibrosis of their biliary tract, which can end up uh, causing portal hypertension. So it's quite incredible all the things that can happen with a child. The manifestations of cystic fibrosis are actually um, um, in a chart on, it's actually box 40-16, and it talks about um, the meconium ileus that I talked about, if the child has a meconium ileus, and then it talks about the GI manifestations, but right now we're talking about respiratory. So the initial signs of a child with cystic fibrosis could be that wheezing and also a dry, non-productive cough. Um, eventually, they'll continue to have increased shortness of breath, um, increased shortness of breath and obstructive emphysema, and then atelectasis. Atelectasis are areas of um, basically destruction and where the lungs are no longer working. Um, progressively, you're going to continue seeing a, a child that develops emphysema, a full-blown barrel chest. Um, remember that cyanosis and hypoxia um, and clubbing of the fingers and toes are signs of hypoxia. Um, they are going to continue to have infections like bronchitis and pneumonia. So that's because of stagnation of mucus and bacterial colonization, which results in destruction of the lung tissue. The tenacious secretions actually block and obstruct the bronchi. So 
from the very early on, parents have to learn how to get rid, to liquefy these secretions and get them out of the child's lungs as much as possible. Um, sadly, there's not a lot of research for cystic fibrosis and I saw a statistic not too long ago that said only 30% of children um, actually live to be uh, 30 years old. So it, is, it does have a high mortality rate as well. Um, with continued damage to the lungs, you're gonna see decreased O2, CO2 exchange, hypoxia, respiratory acidosis, um, and then uh, eventually we're gonna see that these lungs turn into uh, chronic pulmonary lung disease, hypertension, pulmonary hypertension, core pulmonala, which means increased pulmonary artery pressure, respiratory failure, and then eventually death. And a lot of the kids um, become young people that um, have to deal with these, these, these symptoms, and then at some point in their life, they you know, have to uh, be considered, are they candidates for actually lung transplants, which is a critical um, and a very serious thing that they could do. So one of the things that, that affects the kids and probably the, the, the primary thing that happens to these children is that they eventually get a respiratory infection. So one of the slides, uh, slide 96, lists all the possible infectious pathogens that can occur. Um, and so infection is really one of those things, avoiding people that are sick and trying to promote um, respiratory health for as long as possible is one of the goals. Um, so we already talked about how they present that wheezing and dry non-productive cough um, and eventually um, it gets worse and worse. Slide 100 actually talks, shows you a couple things that happens in the lungs as far as the secretions go and it also shows you a picture of some clubbed fingernails. Um, because of how the disease affects kids, lack of oxygenation, hypoxia, we can see delayed puberty in females and actually sterility in males. Parents report that their children's sweat actually tastes kind of salty. It's not unusual for these kids to also become hyponatremic and um, become dehydrated. So you can, I mean, I just keep saying these words, but already I'm thinking of all the things that we might have to do to manage a child that has cystic fibrosis and also how to teach their parents on how to manage these kids. So as I said, in all um, 48 of 50 states, um, newborn screening is considered part of the metabolic screen. Um, and you know, no meconium stool, they'll do a sweat chloride test. They will, uh, after the onset of symptoms, they'll follow that up with some diagnostic things like chest x-rays, maybe pulmonary function tests, and they're also checking the GI tract out. What we find is if the kids can't absorb things well, then they get something called fatty stools and they need, um, uh, they need vitamin replacement and they also need something called enzymes, pancreatic enzymes, with every meal and every snack as part of their regimen. So I've shown you a slide that shows an x-ray with a lot of kids, looks like little bubbles in their lungs. The goals of therapy for the medical field and for nursing is to prevent or minimize pulmonary complications. It's a really tough job. We wanna make sure these kids get adequate nutrition for growth. Once again, if, you're, if you've got a lung issue and you're always trying to work on just breathing, their appetite can be diminished. So that is a very big challenge. And then also um, how to assist in adapting to a chronic illness. This is something that is long-term. There is no cure for it, so it is management. Um, so how do we manage it? Well, respiratory, we want to teach these parents how to do uh, CPT, which is chest physiotherapy. Now, chest physiotherapy involves two things. It involves percussion, where we teach the parents to either use a little percussion hammer or to use their hands, and they go up and down the child's lungs, and they kind of slap on the child's lungs to try to loosen the secretions that are stuck in the outer uh, branches of the lungs and try to get them into the larger airways so that they, the child can have then either coughing or have suction or have some way of bringing those secretions up. We can also use, um, that's one part, is percussion. The other thing that's part of CPT, which is again, remember, chest physiotherapy, is something called postural drainage. So percussion, the actual use of, of a popping, 
and also putting the child in different positions with their head down or turning them over to their side different ways. Those are all part of, of chest physiotherapy. We can also use bronchodilator medications and help them do some exercises, uh, force expiration, other breathing exercises to help them. We have to be aggressive in treating pulmonary infections and sometimes that means um, getting home health involved to do IV antibiotic therapy and aerolized antibiotics if need be. So um, it talks about under care management, it goes to page 12, um, 1239 and then it goes on to pretty much 1241 and it contrasts what would be hospital care versus home care. So the reason that kids come into the hospital with cystic fibrosis is because of pulmonary infection or maybe they have uncontrolled diabetes because of the pancreatic involvement or some other coexisting problem. Um, of course, when cystic fibrosis, if children with cystic fibrosis come into the hospital, we have to use meticulous hand washing because we're trying to um, avoid giving them any of the health care associated infections, also known as nosocomial infections. So we have to use really careful because um, especially if you see anyone um, with MRSA or something like that. Um, the, we also know that um, part of the regimen for hospitalized children with CF, we would see that they will have aerosol therapy and percussion and postural drainage. Respiratory therapists are part of the team that come in to help with these treatments, initiate, supervise, and also teach parents because these parents are going to have to go home learning some of these same things. Um, it could be also that the, the nurse would be um, providing some of these treatments um, if need be. So um, that would be important. Remember that CPT should not be performed uh, and before or immediately after um, a meal um, because you don't want to um, uh, make the child throw up. Um, you want to make it a best experience as possible. So give that child some time. And I think ATI talks a little bit about that time frame too. Um, make sure that as a nurse you're doing really um, close monitoring and assessing of the respiratory pattern, the work of breathing, the lung auscultation, and vital assessments. Again, we're kind of putting in that PAT, pediatric assessment tr uh, triangle, where you're looking at the work of breathing, the color of the child, the behavior of the child. Are they playing or are they restless? That would be a good sign. Uh, oxygen therapy supplemental is, is administered to the child. And of course, the biggest challenge that medicine and nursing has is compliance. Compliance with taking the medications that they need, compliance with parents learning and doing CPT um, if they need to at home. Um, we, we actually, um, the medicines include, uh, like I said, the pancreatic enzymes to help with digestion. Um, they replace vitamins A, D, E, and K. Um, sometimes these kids have, uh, uh, infections like anti, they have fungal infections, so they may need some antifungals, antihistamines, anti-inflammatory agents, and oral antibiotics could all be part of the regimen. So it really is overwhelming to the child and also overwhelming to the family. Um, so uh, the diet for the child with CF, we really need to employ the dietitian to help with this. They could have loss of appetite and weight loss. I've seen children with CF that have very tiny limbs with a big barrel chest. They look really pale, um, not normal coloring at all. Um, early stages, the appetite is not affected, but as they become more chronic, it is a very big difficulty and sometimes a gastrotomy too where some other kind of supplementation has to happen. Um, we also need to remember that these are kids and do some engagement with child life therapy to help them deal with just being kids and, and wanting to stay engaged. And uh, one of my nursing students who had a child adolescent with cystic fibrosis, um, the biggest concern that this child had who was about 15 was, will you, she asked my nursing student, will you help me pick out a prom dress? I've been asked to the prom and here's this child on oxygen, they've got an IV going, they look really sick. And so my students spent time going through catalogs to, to help this young lady um, um, find a prom dress because she wanted to look beautiful at the prom. It's not unusual to deal with a lot of problems that chronic illness brings to children. 
especially children that are older, like depression, anxiety, disturb self-image um, as they occur with cystic fibrosis. Um, and then, of course, um, they understand that something's happening to them, the poor prognosis, and also helping the parents deal with this anticipatory grief. Home care, a lot of times, can be uh, is possible. Uh, the goals of care for home care include normalization and daily activities, including school and, and peer involvement. So be sure that you help that child be as, as comfortable as possible. Flexibility is important. Um, family activities are important. And a lot of times parents with chronically ill children protect them or keep them away from doing the normal things. And so we always have to balance, yes, I have a sick child with how can I make this quality of this child's life um, very special and, and, and treat them like the child that they're supposed to be. Um, so I think that's, a, that's the important balance there. Um, so education is really important. Uh, I do have uh, some respiratory management. It goes on to talk about um, things that can happen to the child. Um, and so a lot, of, a lot of what we talk about is family support. Again, emotional needs of the child and the family because these treatments are multiple times per day. So if you have both parents working, somebody else has to come in and help or maybe a parent will have to quit their job. And um, there's also some guilt probably from the families about genetic transmission of the disease. And so is it, do we need to talk to the parents or the parents and need an opportunity to talk about you know, um, their desire to have more children and what the implications could be for that. Um, so the, if we maximize children with cystic fibrosis, if we can maximize their nutrition, if we can help them prevent and treat with aggression uh, infection and, and use pulmonary hygiene. Now pulmonary hygiene is different than hand hygiene. Pulmonary hygiene includes those things that we talked about, including the phys chest physiotherapy. So good chest uh, physiotherapy. They knew how to have, instead of using uh, just your hands to do uh, percussion, they have vibratory vests that can be used um, to help with helping decrease uh, or release some of that thick, tenacious mucus that occurs. There is always research and hope for the future. Um, and so you'll see that in the medical field, there's gene therapy. That I talked about lung transplants a little bit, and then always looking for you know improved pharmacological agents. Um, page 1241 just talks a little bit about how to transition these children into adulthood, and it talks about life expectancy. So we're hoping it continues to rise, um, but there's always those issues about marriage and sexuality and childbearing and and job choices and career choices that everyone always wants to have. So um, basically adolescents with cystic fibrosis, they're encouraged to take personal ownership and management of their illness to optimize it. And you know, we want them to go to college, we want them to do as much as they can to set goals for themselves. Um, but, but understand that you might have periods where anticipatory grieving is there. Um, and um, supporting families and getting them the support and encouraging them to join support groups because there are cystic fibrosis associations and support groups. So um, there's always hope and um, I have put in, these, in this email a little um, link to a YouTube and uh, I'm hoping that we'll have an opportunity to, to see this in class as well. It's been a pleasure to talk with you about asthma and cystic fibrosis. Thank you so much.